Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Atif Cotter. Thanks for being on the show again, Atif. Thank you so much for having me, Whitney. You know, Atif was just on the show. He's a repeat guest, and it was show number 847. And uh, we had a great conversation. I wanted to have him back because he has, uh, he's very educated, very knowledgeable about many things in our business that uh, I wanted him to share with us and a few more things today that I know is going to be of interest uh, to our listeners. And so, and that show was on February the 14th. Uh, but a little about Atif, he founded Redist. A, a prop tech startup based in Columbia Startup Lab in 2020. And so I'll let him share a little about that. But he's also the host of American Building, a new podcast coming out, launching this fall. Uh, Atif, welcome again to the show. Um, why don't you share just a little more detail about those things and then let's dive in. Sure, absolutely. So um, background wise, I'm a real estate developer. So I come from the industry, uh, primarily the New York City area. Um, I worked for a huge developer called Xtel Development and then started my own development firm. And Whitney mentioned uh, my technology company called Redist, and we are focusing on making it easy to find and use the $100 billion of real estate incentives that are given out every single year in the United States. Um, it's a real interest for me um, from, uh, from like a particular perspective of real estate because uh, not only have I had the opportunity to work in the private sector, but I'm also a city planning commissioner uh, in uh, the city that I live in, in New Jersey. So it's given me a great perspective of the, the two points of view that often come to um, play in, in real estate projects, both large and small. Nice. Well, I want us to maximize our time, uh, Atif, and, and, and I know you, you're right there close to DC as well and have a great handle on a lot of the tax credits and things that are happening. Sure. Uh, and why don't we just jump right into that and some of the things that are happening. I'm sure I'll have some questions as I'm trying to figure out those things or what to expect. And our listeners are, are wondering the same thing, right? Wondering what's coming down the, down the pike uh, you know, and being able to plan. So help us, help us with a few of those things that we were briefly talking about you know, before we got started. Sure, absolutely. So I'm going to, to level set uh, and explain what incentives are and uh, really dive into the tax credit portion and what um, either real estate developers or investors or other professionals um, that are in your amongst your listeners um, can look for in this year, particularly how it affects, it's going to affect their, their, their work and the projects they do. So uh, real estate incentives are a class of public financing or private real estate development. So that can take the form of um, property tax abatements, tax credits, low interest financing, grant programs, rebates. There's a whole slew of uh, different incentives that are, are considered part of that, that pantheon. You could say um, every single year, there's a hundred billion dollars uh, given out um, that's redistributed at the, both the federal, the state and the local level. So why does that particular matter? So wh why does that particularly matter? So tax credits are a particular part of the, uh, the kind of body of real estate incentives that exist. And essentially what they do is use um, reductions in future tax obligations for typically large companies uh, in order to, to raise money at the present time to build. So it's a great way of driving uh, construction in uh, markets that may not be seeing a lot of uh, investor interest. Um, so you're you said using right. future tax obligations to raise money to build. Did I get that yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you might be a tax credit expert yourself. So, <laughs> so um, I don't think so. Apart from that. So basically, the idea is that uh, everyone has to pay taxes, uh, and if uh, the U.S. government allows you to forego paying future taxes uh, and instead give a certain amount of money that you have now at a healthy discount, that creates uh, private money to, uh, to, for, for developers and investors to build. So it's a, it's a great, great structure that exists that doesn't actually take money from taxpayers. It's uh, directly through the government. It comes from private entities and it goes to private entities. So it's a rather efficient structure. Um, there's a number of different incentives that people probably have heard of. So low income housing tax credits are the largest. There were nine and a half billion dollars uh, in uh, 2019. And that's set to wildly increase under the, uh, considerably increase rather, 
under the uh, the HR two, the House Resolution Resolution two, um, the infrastructure bill people talk about, and then also more broadly under the the Biden Build Back Better plan. So now some of the hot topics, some of the things that are going on that um, people in our industry should look for. Uh, number one is um, the fact that the Build Back Better plan has real estate, real estate and infrastructure as the core backbone of building back um, the economy uh, through and then after the Corona depression. So what that breaks down to specifically for tax credits is that the four core tax credits that exist at the federal levels, that's the low income housing tax credits, the new market tax credits, the uh, historic tax credit program and the Brownfields tax credit program. Each one's administered by different groups of the federal government, but all of them will see incredible increases in their allocation. So specifically, low-income housing tax credits are set to go from $9.5 billion a year to $21 billion a year. So that's the main driver of the housing growth that's expected over the next couple of years. I think another hot topic to think about uh, and consider is uh, the power changes in the Senate. So the fact that the Democratic Party now uh, holds the majority with uh, Kamala Harris um, uh, presiding uh, and casting a tying vote, um, the uh, the leadership for key committees in the Senate are going to be incredibly um, telling about how tax credits are going to be part of the upcoming uh, budget for this year. So number one, uh, Vermont is getting a lot of reps. So uh, Bernie Sanders is now the head of the budget committee and Patrick Leahy, both the senators from Vermont, um, is the head of the appropriations committee. Um, both are strong supporters of, uh, of development in general, especially when it drives affordable housing uh, and other social goods like that. So I think you're gonna see a lot of support procedurally uh, for uh, the expansion of these tax credit programs. And I think number three is the needs only gonna get bigger. So for example, some of the original initial estimates are that uh, the taxable receipts uh, from corporations overall, not just real estate, have reduced 80% over last year. So there's a lot of hurt. So there's a lot of good in this idea of future tax obligations being used to drive development now. So that's kind of the, the lay of the land of what's happening in DC and with tax credits. I'm sure those things will be tracked heavily and ensuring you're using those funds for the proper thing, right? <laughs> that's actually a really good good point because a huge part of, um, for example, the um, the Hurricane Sandy uh, relief that happens so primarily for the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, similarly to 2000, uh, 2020, a geyser of money went out really quickly with a relatively little oversight. Uh, so for example, Chris Christie, when he was, um, I believe he was the attorney general of the, the state of uh, New Jersey, one of his particular um, focuses was on rooting out fraud um, related to that. And obviously I think there are some initial estimates that um, up to a quarter of the money that's been given out through uh, PPP and other SBA relief programs have been misused. I don't know if that's a correct number or not, but I've seen that number floating around, which means that it's going to keep lawyers pretty busy <laughs> over the next couple of years. For a long time, no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, what about like renter relief, uh, you know, and the uh, effects of that uh, amongst numerous other things? Absolutely. So uh, for any listeners that are multifamily, uh, investors or developers, this is a really critical point um, because uh, the CDC eviction moratorium has been extended numerous times uh, since last spring uh, when, when, when COVID started. So the, the current one, the current eviction moratorium ends March 31st, um, but there hasn't been any large scale um, relief for landlords from their, uh, their mortgage obligations and their tax obligations. Uh, so through this soup of PPP and SBA um, relief loans, um, uh, small to mid-scale developers and investors like me have been able to uh, keep the lights on and keep, keep operating and maintaining their buildings. Um, but in particular, what's, what's interesting is the federal government is pushing a $25 billion uh, renter relief uh, package, which essentially what that does is uh, provide uh, direct relief to landlords um, that are able to substantiate um, employment loss uh, and other financial disruptions for their tenants. That's not just for affordable housing. That is meant for um, all classes of housing. So that $25, $25 billion uh, rent relief package, I think, is going to be the cornerstone of maintaining the multifamily industry uh, in 2021. Who's going to qualify for that? So it's the exact 
uh, requirements of it uh, are being laid out currently. So Nova Gradic, a, a, a major accounting firm in the United States has done um, a great initial assessment of that. Um, so if your listeners are interested, they should check out uh, Nova Gradic's uh, Tax Credit Tuesday podcast, uh, which, which talks in detail about that. But uh, namely what it does, uh, the initial uh, template of what this plan will be is focusing on um, uh, unemployment declarations of at least three months ago. So if someone has been unemployed for at least three months, um, that's the, kind of the, the, the main criteria. And the idea is for uh, the relief that a landlord receives on behalf of a tenant is meant to pay back rent as opposed to future obligations to bring people current. Um, so it doesn't necessarily cover late fees, but there is a flexibility in and around that because that relief can also be used for, um, for maintenance, utility obligations um, that help uh, defray some of those costs that landlords will have been, will have been incurring despite not having uh, received rent. Okay. Wow. A lot right there that you know, I'll probably have to listen to that again myself, just take some of that in. Uh, but yeah, 25 billion. Is that going to be in this calendar year? Do you know that? Yeah, it's absolutely this calendar year. So um, with uh, the current leadership in the Senate, there is a, uh, a lot of reality. As there's a reality check that you need to go big or go home. So <laughs> I think in this particular case, uh, a, a middle of the road approach doesn't necessarily work because I'm not sure what middle of the road m- means when a quarter of uh, the United States is under threat of eviction or uh, is under financial distress and could be in a position to have housing insecurity in the not, not too distant future. This is one of those those large sort of opportunities to get things right. And I think that that, that motivation is, is very clear because I know that our particular industry, uh, the multifamily sector of our industry is absolutely hurting. So last year, for example, uh, NAREIT's residential index uh, ended the year at negative 22% return negative 22 percent return <laughs> so uh, it's it's not easy to, to to come up with some here's 50 bucks for your for your problems maybe you can solve that so right. that, that, that's not going to work wow well what's what's some other things too that we need to be aware of i know we mentioned it, you mentioned numerous things before we got started yeah i think uh what's what's pretty interesting as well is uh the slew of new tax credit programs that are on the docket uh, to uh, really add to the existing ones that I mentioned. So particularly for multifamily uh, developers and investors, uh, the low-income housing tax credit has long been the cornerstone, but uh, the reality is that you, you limit your rent um, to a, a 60% of the area median income, which means that the math of that doesn't often, doesn't always work for every single developer in every single situation. So um, the reality being that the middle class uh, in the United States generally writ large, uh, has uh, seen declining purchasing power, declining uh, wealth accumulation over the past uh, decade. Uh, Because of that, the Build Back Better plan is focusing on six new tax credits, uh, four of which are focused on middle income housing. So I think uh, particularly for market rate developers that may just ignore tax credits altogether by associating them automatically with affordable housing, that there should be a lot of interest uh, around that in order to drive development, particularly in expensive um, periphery markets. So for example, New Jersey, Southern Connecticut, high construction costs, um, but not necessarily the receipts that warrant um, housing uh, production, particularly for middle-class levels. Interesting. Uh, yeah, you mentioned re- also a like, uh, reduction in taxable receipts. Uh, maybe you can elaborate. Sure, yeah. So what that means is uh, taxation at the corporate level um, is something that is really indicative of interest in tax credits. And the, the connection between the two is this, is that if a company, for example, like Sherwin-Williams, is a huge uh, buyer of tax credits, uh, so is American Express. Um, not that much in tech, for example. Google is really the only one that has gone big into this, but I think that's actually an area of growth. But any of these corporations have tax credit obligations. Uh, and if you are able to shield those tax credit or those tax obligations by purchasing tax credits, you can actually make out in this situation because you buy those, um, those tax credits uh, at a discount, which means that if you needed to pay say the, the math is not perfectly right, I'm just gonna do this for illustrative purposes, but if you had to pay a $10 of taxes 
uh, next year, uh, you're able to forego that by providing $8 of taxes, of $8 of financing now for a syndicator to give to a developer. So if you, people that are much smarter than me will do the, the math at the accounting departments and the legal departments of these companies to see how a particular works. But when the taxable receipts are wildly down, the, the, the next domino effect is that there's very little necessary to shield uh, in terms of tax. And when there's very little to shield, there isn't necessarily huge impetus to buy tax credits. Um, so the idea is to get the engine of the economic, the economic engine of America growing again, because the taxable receipts are essentially the core idea that drives many things, one of which is the, the tax credit market. If you are not able to raise millions of dollars quickly and do not understand some key things your investors are looking for, you are not going to close on your next acquisition. If you're looking for some help to explode your syndication business and wanting to learn from someone that has been in your shoes, I'm ready to help you. I am taking on a few clients over the next three months to ensure their success by learning the things that have helped us to be able to raise over $10 million in 10 hours numerous times. If you are someone that is motivated and ready to take action, apply on our website to see if you qualify. How do you stay up to date on all these things and learn this much about our current tax tax plan for this year? Yeah, I think it's, I would say for me, I, I, I nerd out on a lot of things and one of them is related to um, policy. So from being a city planning commissioner, um, before I took that public role um, as a private developer, I think like many of my colleagues, I would just rail against the public sector with everything wrong, everything they're doing that's related to this incompetence or that incompetence. But I think the reality is that the, the story is much more complex and involves incredible numbers of competing priorities and stakeholders. So for me, having started in that role, uh, for example, in our city, um, we uh, did a master plan re-examination the, the first year that I started. That's a huge opportunity. That's like the redistricting for the for a state legislature for congressional seats. It's that level of, of importance. Doing that, I saw how how important it is to understand what dynamics are at play at the state level and the federal level because of funding for certain things, for example, like parks um, has a big part to play in what we do with our, our zoning. So for me, it's probably um, just the, the curiosity because it has such incredible implications to what I do in my private sector role and then my, my public sector role in my private businesses. Um, but I would say in terms of how I keep, keep abreast of it, um, I would say like most people, I do some doom scrolling on Instagram and I, I subscribe to a bunch of feeds. Uh, I think that besides the traditional um, news sources um, that people are probably very much aware of, uh, like cable TV, um, the one in particular that I like is Mother Jones. Uh, it's a, a news magazine that uh, is named in honor of a, uh, an Irish woman from the early 1900s who is a prominent labor organizer in Philadelphia. Um, so she was a huge part of the organization process that led to unionization, which is a big foundational element of our industry. Um, so their magazine does a lot to identify uh, and call out um, issues that uh, are at play in terms of federal, federal government uh, policy. So I, I really enjoy uh, looking at that. Uh, and the other one I would say is um, I actually particularly enjoy following the uh, social media feeds of of politicians because off the cuff remarks often are much more powerful and telling than some prepared formal statement on the floor of the House or the Senate. So I think seeing the, the winds of change or the, the opinions um, on social media particularly, I think is a great way of seeing what particularly will, will be happening. Nice. Well, uh, you, you've definitely shared a lot that I know the listeners and myself have, have not heard much about. Uh, but ought to, you know, our time has, has flown by. Anything else as far as the uh, incentives and, uh, uh, I mean, or t- just tax in- information that's happening or anything that's happening over this next year you want to leave us with before we move to a few final questions? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say for me, uh, from having been in the industry for 15 years, I can tell you that the incentive process is just, it's a mess. It's just really, really hard to figure out as a principle uh, of how do you find incentives, how do you use them. So uh, I think for me, what I really enjoy about having uh, built and continuing to build Redist 
is uh, is preparing a product and producing a product that is in service of our customers, which are developers and investors just like me. So I think for anyone that's interested in this world, um, particularly because 2020 is going to be a tough year, a tough, tough year for our industry. Um, and for people that are looking to make their, their cap stacks work, that are still looking for new deals, that are trying to, to keep driving their business. Um, but obviously, it's a lot harder to, to underwrite deals now. This is if you've never looked at public financing before in all of its forms, this is the perfect time to do it. So the best thing to do right now is just head to our website, uh, redis.us. That's R-E-D-I-S-T dot U-S. Um, we'll be going to, uh, we'll commercialize. Right now we're doing a pilot program for a small group of, of companies, uh, including, for example, Tishman uh, Capital. Um, but uh, we'll be opening up to the public uh, in April. So we'll be happy to um, have anyone come by, um, check out our product, uh, and get a better grasp of the incentives that are available to them on their specific projects that they're working on. Nice. Well, uh, Atif, uh, what about a couple of daily habits that you have that you are disciplined about? I know we probably shared this last time, but I, I want to hear it uh, again, just that, that have helped you achieve success. Sure. I would say uh, number one would be uh, curiosity about the world around you, um, particularly if you are new to the industry and you've just joined. I can tell you that everything you've seen the past year and this year, nobody has any clue. Nobody has any clue what's going on. Uh, and I think times like this are super hard because it's really tough to get a job, um, for example. But I think it's also an opportunity to uh, really learn a lot about things that people don't know about. So, for example, um, at Redist, uh, we're a team of seven. We have three product managers. Um, all of them could probably have gotten excellent jobs at Tishman Spire or any other Goldman Sachs or anything like that. But all three of them are getting an incredible uh, boot camp in public financing and what that means. And that will make them incredibly successful developers down the road if that's what they choose to do or investors or PE um, folks down the road. So I would say find particular niches of things that are unusual and weird right now that people don't understand and really go after that. I think opportunity zones, it's like, oh, like last year's story, but find the opportunity zones of this year uh, and go after that. Like hemp is another one, for example, at the at the city planning commission where, where, where I have the public sector role, hemp has come up and marijuana has come up quite frequently. Uh, so if that's an area of interest, just find out how to make that work uh, and go after that. That's probably the biggest piece of advice that I would have. Uh, stay curious and keep learning about things that people don't know about. And, uh, and maybe you just talked about it, but the number one thing that's contributed to your success. Uh, I would say the number one thing would be, that's a really good question. I would say it's honestly, it's having people to ask questions about and to, to level set. So I think um, for me, uh, in terms of, for example, Redist, uh, the reason that we've been able to be so successful and have 125 pilot users at this point that are interested in what we're doing uh, is we have incredible investors that have been really good at uh, keeping us on the course and uh, giving us their feedback. So I think one in particular would be uh, the founder of Honest Buildings. So it's another technology company. I actually interned for them when I was at Columbia. The founders, Riggs Kubiak, he used to work at Dishman Spire as well. Uh, and he sold, he built and sold his company to Procore. So he made it, he, he did it. He, the whole story, he did it. So uh, him, I think is, uh, him and people like him are a big part of the reason that I've been successful in, in Redis and also in, in generally in the, um, the other endeavors that I've pursued uh, prior to Redis as well. And how do you like to give back? So I would say for me, a huge part of it is that, uh, is by ensuring that everyone that wants to vote has the ability to vote. So a lot of these issues that we've talked about are being designed, developed, and executed by people that are voted into office. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that the, the people that are in, in, in Trenton, in the case of New Jersey or Washington, DC, are meant to answer to us, the taxpayers. So if we aren't able to understand what their priorities are and what they actually do once they get to office, 
Uh, and then secondarily, not necessarily have the information to vote and vote intelligently. That's a big problem. That is a big, big problem, not only as a, um, a professional or industry to make sure our industry's priorities are protected, but as taxpayers in general to make sure that our money is used for good use. So uh, for me in particular, over the past six months, um, I've really focused and I will continue doing, um, focusing to, to make sure uh, particularly young people, older people, new Americans, all understand the process of voting uh, and uh, what it means to vote. So I, I speak a couple languages. So in particular, I've been focusing on Spanish language outreach in Arizona and Pennsylvania and Georgia. So unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to go to Arizona or Georgia yet, but I've spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania and I can um, really emphasize how, how critical it is for people to understand the process of voting, have all the information they need, and then go vote and make the best choices for them and their communities and their businesses. Nice. Well, I'm uh, grateful again for your time and just being on the show, being willing to share so much with us. I mean, from uh, you know incentives and tax credits that it seems very detailed and complicated, but it's stuff that we need to need to know or at least be aware of, you know, as we're planning and thinking through our business for for this year and years to yes. come, no doubt. Uh, and so, thank you again. Uh, tell tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you again. Sure, absolutely. The best way to get in touch is on LinkedIn. Uh, so uh, just LinkedIn message me uh, and I'll be happy to respond there. So it's, uh, my, my name is Atif Gather. So there's probably not too many <laughs> like me with that name. So it's, uh, you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.